Hi everyone, and welcome back to a supplementary video for the New Testament survey course. This is a supplement to our survey of Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians. In this section, we'll look in more detail at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31, but we'll also include verse 17. This is a very important passage. In it, Paul talked about his approach to ministry, and it's all about the crucified Messiah. And of course, this reveals deep and wonderful things about God and His purposes, but it also gives us a fuller understanding and application of the gospel. So this is an important passage for us to consider in some more detail. And I invite you to keep your Bible open as we read and then work through these verses. Keep your eye on the text so that you can see it for yourself. This passage says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, not with wisdom of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made empty. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but to us, to those being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will invalidate the intelligence of the intelligent. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this world? Hasn't God shown the wisdom of this world to be foolish? For because in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of what is proclaimed. Because both Jews ask for signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we proclaim Christ having been crucified. This is a scandal to Jews, and it is foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those that are called, both Jews and Greeks, it is Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than that of humans, and the weakness of God is stronger than that of humans. For brothers, notice your own calling, that not many were wise according to the flesh, not many were powerful, not many were well-born. But God selected the foolish ones of the world in order to put the wise ones to shame. And God selected the weak ones of the world in order to put the strong ones to shame. And God selected the insignificant ones of the world, and those of no account, those not being anybody, in order to put those being somebody to shame, in order that all flesh would not boast before God. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that the one boasting, let him boast in the Lord, just as it is written. Now, there's a ton of great stuff here, and we'll try to break it down, understand it, and apply it. First, let's try to see this passage in its larger context, in order to understand it better. In the overall context of the book of 1 Corinthians, you might remember from the survey of this book that the purpose of the entire letter was to call this church back to the gospel of the crucified servant Messiah, back to the source of true wisdom and power, because they had strayed into a false view, which caused many attitude and behavior problems. And this passage is near the beginning of this letter, where Paul addressed the problem of boasting in human leaders, which led to divisions. Their boasting in human leaders and achievement contradicted the gospel by which they were saved. And Paul responded, by talking about true Christian ministry that conforms to the gospel. He addressed the problem underlying their misunderstanding of leadership by bringing them back to the gospel of a crucified Messiah. When we truly get the cross deep in our souls, the kind of divisions and pride and selfishness that characterize the Corinthians is just unthinkable. So Paul solved the division problem by addressing the gospel problem, the cross problem. They had not fully grasped and applied the cross. And the key to understanding this passage is to notice the contrast that Paul made in verse 17 between proclaiming the gospel and words of human wisdom. And he rejected human wisdom so that the cross would not be emptied. For Paul, it's either the cross of Christ or human wisdom. You can't have both. And that is the contrast that he emphasized throughout this passage. 
Now, to understand this contrast a little bit better, we can look at the broader historical context, and that'll help us understand what Paul meant by words of human wisdom, and why that was a big deal for the Corinthians, and why Paul felt the need to address and reject that approach. Their concern was with wisdom, as they understood it, from their pagan background. As Paul will say in this passage, Greeks were enamored with wisdom. They made an emphasis on rhetorical and speaking skill and their ability to impress and convince people. They, they made a big deal of their form of communication, more so even than the content, and Paul refused to do the same. So, Paul addressed the underlying issue of their standards of wisdom, power, and significance. He asked, in essence, how do you know what is wise and powerful and significant? How do you recognize wisdom? What is your definition of wisdom? And are you sure that that is a good definition? Now, when Paul and the Corinthians used the word wisdom, they meant something like we would mean by worldview. It was an explanation of all of life in order to bring order and control over life. Their teachers were proclaiming, this is what the world is like, and here's how we can influence it for our benefit. Now, there were a variety of different worldview explanations and techniques of control, but the overall approach and purpose was the same, to understand the world and to use this knowledge to succeed in life. But Paul thought of all of these things as false wisdom, totally inadequate, either to explain or to successfully live life. And this is because their approach to wisdom was characterized by two things. First, it was based on subjective human thought, not on the solid objectivity of God. Any understanding of the world that starts with and relies upon human understanding is very limited because humans are limited and finite, and it will always disappoint. Anything that explains life with humanity at the center, with humanity in control, is just wrong, according to the biblical worldview, because God is the one in control. That is the dividing line of all worldviews, whether we start with human standards or God's standards. Where, whether we ultimately rely on our wisdom or on God's revelation. Whether we ask, how does God fit into my world? Or we ask, how do I fit into God's world? And by the way, this is the fatal flaw of all of the postmodern philosophies that are influencing our current culture. And sadly, many churches and Christians have bought into this backward way of seeing the world and trying to live. See, God is God, and we're not. God is smarter than we are. God is ultimate, and we are not. So any way of thinking that does not put Him at the center and foundation is wrong, and it will make our life go wrong. And that leads into the second character of their approach to wisdom. It tended to cause people to become prideful in their own wisdom and accomplishments. They started to think that they had it all figured out, and therefore they were something special. They, they started to believe that they were smarter or more powerful than others, and therefore they pridefully relied upon and boasted in their own position and achievement. That is the mindset that Paul was pushing back against in this passage. And I also want to introduce what I call the rhetorical context. And by that, I mean the way that Paul communicated in this section. In this passage, sometimes Paul uses what I call sarcastic air quotes. Let me explain. In some cases, when Paul used the word wisdom, he was talking about genuine wisdom, which he would agree with. He talked about God's wisdom, which is truly wise and helpful. But in other cases, when Paul used the word wisdom, he was talking about the mindset that the Corinthians thought was wisdom, but Paul didn't. This was so-called wisdom. It was wisdom, air quote wisdom. So, sometimes Paul used the word wisdom sarcastically 
for something that he did not really consider to be wise, just the opposite. So in this passage, Paul used the words wisdom, power, foolishness, and weakness in different ways. Sometimes he meant them literally, but sometimes he used them tongue-in-cheek to actually imply the opposite of what these words usually mean. So watch for this, that Paul uses these same words in different ways, depending on the context. Now, let's look at the overall outline and flow of thought in this passage. It's divided into two main sections, but I will list three. And that's because I've started with verse 17, which is really a part of the previous paragraph. But I've included it here because it gives the important context to understand this passage. It introduces the main contrast that Paul addressed in the rest of these verses. In verse 17, Paul contrasted the cross with human wisdom and wise speech. He downplayed and criticized the human-centered alternatives because they're counterproductive and because these are mutually exclusive. If your wisdom can save you, then there's no need for the cross of Christ. But Paul raised this contrast primarily to put the emphasis back on the cross. If the cross is the only thing that really can save you, which it is, Paul said we must reject human wisdom as the way of salvation. And then, in the rest of the passage, Paul elaborated on this contrast between God's way and human wisdom. Then, the first main section describes the contrast between God's standards and human standards. And the reason for this is that relying on human wisdom betrays the gospel. And the evidence that Paul gave is that people concluded the gospel to be foolish when judged by their standards. But they were wrong. It's not foolish, but it's God's power and wisdom. So, Paul countered, that preaching Christ crucified keeps us from emptying the cross. It prevents us from losing the true wisdom and power of the crucified Messiah. And then the second main section describes the contrast between boasting in God and boasting in human wisdom. And the reason is that boasting in human achievement betrays the gospel. And the evidence is that those with nothing to boast about are the ones who received the benefits of the gospel. So, Paul countered that boasting only in Christ crucified keeps us from emptying the cross. It keeps our delight and focus on the crucified Messiah, who is the source of all righteousness and wisdom. We can't boast in our own achievement that we somehow deserve salvation because of our wisdom or status. And in both these sections, Paul is obviously showing by these contrasts not only that these two different ways are incompatible, you have to choose one way or the other, but he's also showing that God's way of the crucified Messiah is obviously the better way, the only possible way to receive genuine salvation, because God is wiser and more powerful than we are. All right, that's the overall outline of this passage. Now let's work through this passage in more detail. Like I mentioned, verse 17 is not technically part of this passage, but it's basically the theme statement from the previous paragraph, which states the topic that will be explained in this passage. In verse 17, Paul stated that his main mission, given by God, was to proclaim the gospel. And he explained, by contrast, the way in which he was to proclaim the good news. He was not to do it with what he called words of human wisdom. This wisdom of word is likely something that the Corinthians valued because of their pagan background, as we saw earlier. But Paul absolutely refused to play by those rules or proclaim the gospel in a manner that would fit those expectations. And the reason he gave is so that the cross will not be emptied of its power. Now, that does not mean that the good news of Christ crucified could actually be made powerless. The gospel is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. What Paul meant was that the effectiveness of the gospel is diminished 
by us not tapping into its power because we try to substitute something else which has no power. For instance, my video camera is functioning because it's plugged into an electrical outlet over there on the wall, and that's why you're able to see me. But think about, if I would unplug the camera's cord from that outlet and try to put the plug into my ear, the camera wouldn't work because there's no electrical power there. Paul is saying that it would be just as futile and powerless to unplug his preaching from the power of the gospel and to try to plug it into human wisdom. It would be totally ineffective and therefore foolish to try it because there is no power there. And then the rest of this passage explains why human wisdom is totally ineffective for salvation and why the gospel of the crucified Messiah is totally effective, because it is the power and wisdom of God. And that brings us to the first major section of this passage. The first reason Paul gave is that human wisdom betrays the gospel, but preaching Christ keeps from emptying the cross. The cross destroys the need to rely on false human wisdom, because it is the power and wisdom of God. Paul explained that the message of the cross is purposely opposed to human standards. His first evidence of this is that the message is received differently by different groups, based on their different standards. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And the cross is the dividing line. It's foolish to those who are perishing. The, the philosophers at Athens and Festus at Paul's trial and others, they all called Paul foolish because they did not understand or believe what he was talking about. But that demonstrated more about their own ignorance and pride than it did about Paul and his message, because this very message is the power of God for us who are being saved. What the unbelieving world thinks is wise is really foolish. What the world thinks is foolish is really wise. Now, you might have noticed that many times different people see the exact same thing or hear about the exact same event and come to completely different conclusions. And that usually shows that the way they thought about this event was colored by their worldview, by their underlying standard by which they understood and judged everything. That is, the mental goggles through which we see the world, the assumed standard by which we measure what is right and wrong. And everybody does this to some extent. So the real issue is having the right foundational standard, having the correct glasses that let us see the world clearly as it really is and not distorted in some way. And that is why Paul used sarcastic air quotes to speak about their upside-down way of thinking about the cross. At the heart of the issue is whose standards are used to determine if something is wise and strong or not. Whose definition of wisdom should be used? The Corinthians' definition, which comes from their pagan background, or God's definition, shown in the crucified Messiah? Now, this passage is somewhat negative to make a positive point. Their evaluation is wrong because their standard is wrong. And here is the true standard and evaluation. The message of the cross is received differently by different groups, and one group is wrong because their standard of judgment is wrong, because it is built only on subjective human wisdom. And this differing reaction is part of God's plan. God purposed to highlight the massive difference in standards of evaluation. He designed to show that mere human wisdom is not the same as God's wisdom, and his purpose was to confront human wisdom as inadequate. And this is shown first in the quote from Isaiah chapter 29 verse 14 that we see in verse 19 of this passage. God said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will frustrate 
the understanding of the intelligent. Now, why would God do this? Aren't wisdom and understanding desirable and good? And why did Paul quote this verse here in Corinthians? Well, again, the issue is what kind of wisdom and understanding we're talking about. Is it the kind of wisdom and knowledge which elevates human achievement without God, or the kind of wisdom and knowledge which depends on God and submits to God? Can we have true knowledge and wisdom independent from God, or are we dependent on God for true wisdom and knowledge? Do we think we're smarter than God? We're the ones that need to be saved. Therefore, we're not the ones smart enough to save ourselves, and especially not to determine the best way for us to be saved. And the implication Paul drew from this in verses 20 and 21 is that mere human wisdom is not viable. It is insufficient, and this is on purpose. Specifically, he stated that those people who have high status by human standards are not necessarily important by God's standards. And Paul used a series of rhetorical questions to show that these kind of people, they are insignificant compared to the cross. He wrote, where is the wise man? And that means the wise man is nothing compared to the wisdom of the cross. It's kind of like the old detergent commercial, where the shirt looks white and clean until it is compared with the one that really is bright white, and then the first shirt kind of looks dingy gray by comparison. Now, the wise man certainly could be much wiser than other men, but he's nothing compared with God's wisdom. And Paul goes on. Where is the scribe? The scribe, the learned man, the legal expert, is not significant compared to the wisdom of the cross. Now, by the way, the wise man, as we'll see, was the trusted expert in Gentile society, and the scribe was the trusted expert in Jewish society. So Paul was covering both backgrounds. And then the third term is an overarching term that applies to both. Where is the debater? the philosopher of this age. The professional communicator, the talking head of this age, is not significant compared with the truth of the cross. And the phrase, of this age, probably goes with all three questions, and that's the main point. All these people and their approach to life comes from this age, from a merely human mentality that will always fall short of God's wisdom. And then Paul gave the general principle behind his previous statement, using another rhetorical question. Hasn't God made the wisdom of this world foolish? Now, wisdom of this world, like the wise men of this age, they're, they're both connected to what is merely human and finite. And so, they fall dramatically short and are inadequate for salvation. And God demonstrated its inadequacy and foolishness by the cross. The wisdom of this world is simply not as significant as they thought. Rather, it is foolish, especially when compared with God's wisdom. And then in verse 21, Paul explained the reason behind this principle and the reason behind God's action in salvation in this way. God purposely made salvation to be in a way that excludes human merit, and standing. God's wisdom is to not reveal himself through human wisdom, or else we would rely on human wisdom and not on him. Paul said, for since the world did not know God through wisdom, and he assumed as a given fact that the world does not and cannot know God on its own, by its own wisdom. And this happened, as Paul said, because of the wisdom of God. It was God's wise choice to exclude human achievement and standing from our salvation. And this was to protect us from pride and idolatry. See, no one is able to say, I found God by my own wisdom, or I earned my way with God, or I am more qualified to be saved than the next guy. See, God is passionate that part of gospel salvation is the humbling of human pride and pretense, so that we no longer 
can put our hope and trust in ourselves or in any human things, including human leaders. And God is loving, so he purposely destroys this false wisdom that would keep us from him and from his true salvation and from true wisdom, so that we can only trust in God and his provision in the cross and resurrection of Christ. See, salvation is not just for the elite who can figure it out and understand God by their accomplishment of wisdom. Rather, Paul stressed, God is pleased in his wisdom to save those who simply believe through the foolishness of what was preached. The way of salvation is something totally unexpected and outside our ability to attain on our own. None of us would have thought up the cross on our own, not in a million years. To us, it seems foolish. But that's what God did. And that is what the Scripture and the Church proclaim. And that is how people are saved. The only way people can be saved. It is by Christ's accomplishment, not ours, and simply through our hearing and trusting in what Christ has done. It's not those who are wise enough or strong enough or virtuous enough or socially connected enough who are saved. It's those who believe the message of the crucified Messiah. And this message has proved more powerful and life changing than anything humans have ever dreamed up by far. God's wise purpose was to show that human wisdom is inadequate compared with God's way of salvation. And it's inadequate even to evaluate God's way of salvation. And therefore, the gospel divides all humanity into two and only two categories. Those who are perishing because they think the cross is foolish, and those who are being saved because they believe the gospel. Then in verses 22 through 25, Paul summarized the implications of what he had just written. Because the message of the cross is purposely contrary to human standards, God's entire way of salvation is contrary to human standards. Humans value those things and people that are outwardly impressive by our own skewed standards. And by the way, an important life lesson for Christian maturity is to learn to discern what is real to find out what is true among all the noise of mere opinion, to recognize what is reality and not just appearance and image and propaganda. So sometimes we have to dig deeper to discern what is really the case. Now, human wisdom often gets it wrong, e even in mundane things, and human wisdom always gets it wrong on salvation. And even worse, we can become prideful in our own wisdom and accomplishment and ignore God. So unless we conform our entire mindset to God's revelation, we will be wrong. Remember, the truth of Christ is foolishness, both to Jews and to Gentiles, which covers all of us. And the standard by which we judge will determine if our judgment is sound or not. We too often judge God by how well he conforms to our expectations, to our desires and demands. And that is ultimately self-centered, thinking that God only exists for our benefit, when in reality, we only exist for Him. Now, in this section, Paul gave two examples of this faulty judgment based on faulty standards. First, he wrote that Jews ask for signs. That is, they, they want to somehow tap into God's power for their own benefit. Back in the Gospels, we saw the Jewish leaders asked Jesus for a sign, even though he had already been doing many signs. They demanded signs on their terms, when they demanded it, and by their standards. But Jesus refused, and he rebuked them. Because God refuses to, to dance whenever we snap our fingers. God refuses to be a genie or a vending machine. God refuses to do things just to impress people and live up to our standards of what is impressive. God refuses to be manipulated and controlled by humans. And he refuses to even give the impression that he could be manipulated or controlled. See, he, he gently but clearly shows that he is God, that he is the one in con 
complete control and that we're not. And Paul went on to say that Greeks seek wisdom and pursue understanding and control. That is, they want to somehow tap into special knowledge for their own benefit. They thought they had to figure everything out in order to control the world. If we just had enough science and technology, we could create a perfect society. Does that sound familiar? But God refuses to conform to our latest principles for success. God refuses to go on the talk shows and explain himself to our satisfaction. God refuses to be relevant by our standard of relevance. Instead, he gently but firmly shows that he is smarter than we are. He knows what he's doing, and he's not accountable to us to explain himself. In other words, Paul has described humanity's two basic idolatries, power and knowledge. And we seek after both in order to exercise control for our own selfish use. But God rejects all forms of human pride and makes salvation out of reach of our attainment, so that he frees us from such selfish idolatry. He will not do it that way. And so, Paul said, we faithful Christians do it completely opposite from the world's way. We minister God's way. We proclaim Christ crucified. Christ crucified is infinitely more important than human works or wisdom, which accomplish nothing. And by the way, that's why Paul proclaimed Christ crucified even when it was not popular and even when it was not well received. What else could he do? What else could he possibly preach that would have been more helpful, more powerful? And now, it might have been very popular and outwardly successful for Paul to preach moralism or self-help philosophy or various human methods of wisdom and success. It certainly would have got him beat up a lot less. But Paul cared for people so much that he would not give them medicine that does not heal. And so he proclaimed the crucified Messiah, who is our only true hope. And then Paul explained why he proclaimed the cross. First, he acknowledged some mistaken views about Christ crucified. This is a scandal to the Jews. Now, the word scandal means something so offensive that we viscerally react against it and strongly oppose it. Now, we have to understand how they came to this conclusion. For a Jew, a crucified Messiah is an oxymoron, like a victorious loser. All Jews knew that Messiah is a conqueror, not a victim. They could not connect the idea of a conquering king like David with Isaiah's suffering servant. How could they believe in a God who loses? They were scandalized because they did not see the entire picture. We know from the New Testament that he was a conquering Messiah by suffering, as we talked about in earlier sections. And Paul went on, this is also foolishness to the Gentiles. It's folly. It's insanity, according to their way of thinking. And again, we can understand how they came to that conclusion. Because kings are powerful and heroic and proud, and they demand others to serve them. In that worldview, kings and gods don't lose and give themselves and serve others and die. We often forget in our day and age that the cross is actually a symbol of a shameful execution. To be crucified in that society was the ultimate failure and disgrace. It was never discussed in polite company. But nowadays, the cross is the symbol of the church in which we glory. How backward is that? But you see, we see the entire story. What seemed foolish and bad was actually part of God's good, wise plan all along. And that is why Paul immediately followed this with the true evaluation of the cross. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God to those who are called, both Jews and Gentiles. Now, even though we don't fully understand 
and it goes against many of our expectations, it doesn't make sense from a worldly perspective, but from God's perspective, it is perfect because it puts Him at the center and displays His true power and genuine wisdom as infinitely greater than ours. For those who are called, the proclamation of the cross shows itself to be the power and wisdom of God. Our cultural background doesn't matter at all. What matters is the call of God in the message of the cross. The cross divides all humanity into the only two divisions that should matter to us, those who are perishing and those who are being saved. Those who reject the cross as foolishness or those who see the cross as God's wisdom and power. The cross is the power of God because God's way is better. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. Now, of course, when Paul says God's foolishness, he meant air quote foolishness. Foolish from a human perspective, but in reality, it is wisdom higher than anything humans could even comprehend. There is profound wisdom in the cross. It is a foolishness so wise that it reconciles us to God and renews the entire universe. That's a mighty wise foolishness. And in the same way, the weakness of God is stronger than the strength of men. Again, air quote weakness, weak from a human perspective, but in reality, it is infinite divine strength and power beyond our comprehension. There is profound strength hidden in the weakness of a dying Messiah. It accomplishes eternal salvation by dying in weakness. Weakness so strong that it brings us eternal life from eternal death. That's a mighty strong weakness. All right, let me briefly summarize and apply Paul's argument so far. If the cross is God's wisdom and power, which it is, and if human wisdom and insight is weakness and folly by comparison, which it is, then those who think the cross is foolishness, they are the ones who are the fools. If we think it is weak, then we're the ones who are really weak. If we reject the gospel as insufficient and look for something better in human wisdom and strength and technique, then we just do not get the cross of Christ to the extent that we should. It is sufficient for everything we need. Therefore, we should not rely on our own standards of wisdom and power to stand in judgment of God's wisdom and power, which is shown in the manner that He chose to save us by a crucified Messiah. And so we need to ask, how is this reflected in our lives and ministries? Are we trying to work to save ourselves and others based on our own skill, experience, insight, or talent? Or are we fleeing to Christ? and his cross, and leading others to do likewise? Are we trying to win the world using the latest techniques and fads, or are we clinging to the cross and proclaiming a crucified Messiah? Do we point to ourselves, to our leaders, to our methods, to our hipness or niceness, or do we glory in God's crucified Messiah, his power and wisdom inherent in the cross? Can we truly say with Paul, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe? Do we trust God's wisdom and power in the cross, or do we try to supplement it with our own wisdom and power and good ideas? Do we think we're smarter than God? Don't be a fool. Reject relying on our own wisdom so that we don't empty the cross. Now let's move on to the second major section, which is just further explanation and application of the same contrast that we saw in the first section. This is Paul's second reason not to rely on human wisdom and achievement, because boasting in human achievement betrays the gospel and empties the cross. Just like relying on human wisdom and attainment is foolish, boasting in these things is equally foolish. Rather, we should boast in Christ who is the power and wisdom of God. The cross destroys the need to boast in human achievement and status. 
Now, Paul explained this from the Corinthians' own experience. He pointed out what the Corinthians were not and why that mattered. Their own salvation showed that God chose unimpressive people. Paul drew attention to their own background and standing to make his point. In general, he said, notice your own calling. That is, notice your own situation in life when you were called and the way in which you were called to Christ. And then he specifically mentioned that not many of them were wise according to the flesh, that is, according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful in terms of worldly influence, and not many were well-born, that is, born into upper-class influence, clout and money, etc. Their salvation proved that being those kind of people is not a necessary qualification for salvation. But we also need to notice that he said not many. He did not say not any. There were some rich and powerful people among the Corinthian church. Because being poor and foolish does not make a person more qualified than being rich and educated. That would be the exact same mistake, just in a different direction. Our status, according to human standards, does not matter. And so we should not pretend that it does. And Paul went on to give the theological reason why not many of them were impressive people. Because God chose unimpressive people in order to put the impressive people to shame. God did this to humble the people who thought they were impressive by human standards, to keep them from relying on themselves or their status or their power. And the way in which Paul wrote puts the emphasis on the word God in each of these statements. God chose you, fools, to humble the wise. God chose you, weaklings, to humble the strong. God chose you, insignificant nobodies, to humble the somebodies. God chose the insignificant things of the world and the despised things, even the things that are not, for the purpose of nullifying the worldly things that are. Again, God's clear purpose is to make a distinction between His way and humanity's way, in order to demonstrate that He is God and we are not, and to protect us from the idolatry of relying on ourselves. And Paul says as much in verse 29, which tells the purpose why God did all this. The purpose of all this is to cut off human boasting. God chose the weak and the fools, etc., so that all flesh cannot boast before God. And Paul used the term flesh intentionally. It's the term that emphasized humanity's sinfulness and weakness when compared to God. And all means all. Absolutely no one can boast before God. If we were chosen because we were rich or famous or smart or talented or nice or well-behaved or a preacher's kid, etc., then we would be tempted to boast. We would be tempted to think that it's somehow more appropriate that we experience salvation rather than those other people. But as we'll see in Ephesians, salvation is by grace, not by works, so that no one can boast. God's not glorified when we think highly of ourselves or of one another, but God is glorified when human pride and achievement is humbled before his infinite greatness and worthiness. We're not saved because we're worthy, but because Christ is worthy on our behalf. And salvation is received through faith, not by our accomplishment. And we should never think of our faith as something that we did to cause ourselves to experience salvation. We have no reason to boast in ourselves concerning our salvation. And that was God's intention all along. Because in the final verses of this passage, Paul tells us that God's salvation led to boasting only in Christ. And again, Paul used the Corinthians' own experience as proof. He wrote, You yourselves are in Christ Jesus because of Him, or from Him, obviously implying that this is not because of you. It is what He did and what He is. He became wisdom for us from God. That the wisdom that the Corinthians were so enamored with, that they sought, 
was not to be found in human speculation. It is to be found in Christ, who is wisdom from God, the only source of true wisdom. And Paul elaborated on this by describing Christ as righteousness and holiness and redemption. Now, we looked at some of those terms in a previous supplementary section, so I won't go through them here. But Christ is the source and epitome of righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. He personifies God's perfect wisdom. And he gives to his people all those things that the Corinthians were seeking in human wisdom, but never could find there. What we so desperately need and desire, what we could never find in any merely human wisdom, power, speculation, or project, we have only in Christ. And we have it freely and abundantly in Christ. And the purpose for this, according to Paul in the last verse, is so that whoever boasts, let him boast in the Lord, just as it is written. Now, Paul was quoting just a phrase from Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. But he most likely intended to imply all that Jer Jeremiah said in those verses. See, the whole passage in Jeremiah says, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, or the strong man boast in his strength, or the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. You see how these verses apply directly to the mindset that Paul was correcting in the Corinthian church? And we see from this that God's plan all along was to teach all people what is truly important. We strive after merely human wisdom, but that's not worth boasting about compared to Christ. We strive after merely human strength and power, but that's not worth boasting about compared to Christ. We strive after riches and influence and fame, but all of that is nothing compared to Christ, who is wisdom, righteousness, grace, love, power, etc. He's the infinite source of all that is good and great, and he is good to us by the cross, because he is great. The crucified Messiah is all the wisdom we will ever need. Why would we go anywhere else? And so, what are we looking at? What are we looking for? What are we looking to for our satisfaction? What are we boasting in as most important? I agree with Paul that we should look to Christ and boast in Christ alone, and not in human standards, human status, or accomplishment. So Paul, in a few ways, has made a strong contrast between the things that humans normally hope and trust in and the cross of Christ. He has contrasted the standards by which we typically judge what is good with the cross of Christ. And he's shown that all these things are wrong and impotent compared with the crucified Messiah. Because God is wiser and stronger than anything humans can come up with. And so, we need to reject relying on our own wisdom and standards and embrace God's wisdom and power shown in the cross. And that means that the cross is to be all and end all. As Gordon Fee wrote, the cross is not something to which one may add human wisdom and thereby make it superior. Rather, the cross stands in absolute, uncompromising contradiction to human wisdom. The cross, in fact, is folly to wisdom humanly conceived. But it is God's folly, folly that is at the same time his wisdom and power. So, if we try to add our own wisdom and effort to the cross, we actually take away from it. The cross is sufficient on its own for all our salvation and life, and this totally invalidates human self-sufficiency. So what now? What difference should this make in our own lives? Let me suggest a few applications, and the first comes directly from Paul in the very next verses. Watch your ministry methods. 
Paul refused to use ministry methods that would betray the gospel or empty the cross. He wrote, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come according to superiority of word or wisdom as I proclaimed to you the mystery of God. And the reason he gave in the next verse is for I determined to not know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So, if you have or in or aspire to have any ministry responsibility whatsoever, beware of trying to substitute something other than Christ crucified as the main topic and resource of your ministry, because there's nothing better and more effective. Now, the second application, which is also from Paul later in this book, is watch the ministry leaders that you follow. Now, respect and affirm them as much as they are worthy of this respect. But don't elevate them beyond what is appropriate. They're only servants, and they're fallible. Reverend so-and-so did not save you. The crucified Messiah did. And the message is more important than the messenger. Now, I'm always suspicious of any Christian leader that insists that his name is on everything, that his picture is featured on everything that the ministry does. I'm suspicious of Christian leaders that draw more attention to themselves than they do to the crucified Messiah. And I'm also suspicious of Christian leaders who worry more about their methodology than about their message, who worry about the style and being contemporary or politically correct or politically incorrect or whatever, more than they worry about knowing the truth of Christ and making him known. If a leader modifies what they talk about based on what an unbelieving world wants to hear, then they're not faithful to their calling to proclaim the crucified Messiah. And the third application is also from Paul in this book. In chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, he wrote, If anyone thinks he is wise by the standards of this world, let him become a fool, so that he may, may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. Therefore, watch your standards. Watch what you rely on. Don't rely on human wisdom or accomplishment at all. Rely on the cross. Rely on God's standards, God's wisdom that comes from God's word. Become a fool and work and weak in the eyes of the world. Now that does not mean that we should be actually be foolish or not accomplish anything. We should strive to be wise and upright and strong, but according to God's standards. And we should never put our trust in these things. We're not saved because we're better or smarter than others. Of course, we should try to be better and smarter than we were yesterday. But this happens as a result of our salvation. It's not the cause. So don't rely on or boast in these things. Rely and boast only in the cross of Christ. And don't buy into the world's standards about what is good and what is important. Why would we care about what a world that does not know God thinks about God? In other words, our society as a whole does not know God and rejects his standards, so why should we want to conform to its views about God or follow its standards? We can be foolish and weak in the eyes of the world in order to walk in the wisdom and power of God. So, watch out that you do not move away from or neglect the cross of the crucified Messiah. To go beyond the cross is to abandon Christ. To want to move on from the cross to something more spiritual or wise or practical is to go away from Christ to human wisdom. If the cross and resurrection are not central to what you're doing, you've wandered away from Christ and unplugged yourself from God's power. And that means that the cross of Christ, the crucified Messiah, is always the central message and focus of faithful Christians and faithful churches. Now, of course, sometimes we should address social, ethical, even political issues as an application and defense of the Christian worldview. The cross reaches, touches, changes all those areas, but we should never concentrate on ethical, political, or social issues as the core of who we are and what we do. The cross is the core. By the cross, 
the crucified Messiah changes people, and in that way, he changes their ethics, politics, and social interactions. See, you'll never change the world by only addressing those things. But if we proclaim the cross of Christ and apply the cross to those things, the world will be changed because people will be changed. Therefore, keep the cross central. Now, let's review. In this passage, Paul contrasted human wisdom with the cross of Christ. Humanity is either perishing or being saved, as demonstrated by how they react to the cross. What seems foolish by human standards is the power and wisdom of God. God purposely shows human wisdom and standards to be foolish by comparison. God saves people in a way that humbles our pretensions, so that we would boast only in Christ, who is the personification of God's wisdom and power. All right, there's so much here. I hope you're able to grasp what this passage is saying, and not just understand it, but embrace what Paul taught so that you conform your standards of thinking and living to the supernatural wisdom and power of the crucified Messiah. Now, speaking of the crucified and risen Christ, there is one more supplemental section on 1 Corinthians, where we will look in more detail at a passage in chapter 15 and then we'll survey Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And I hope to see you there. Thanks for watching.